go. So um, I have us uh, having left off in our book of Judges on page 166 uh, in chapter one. Uh, still, it's a long chapter, uh, but we'll finish the chapter and hopefully do a lot of, uh, uh, hopefully be able to do chapter two today as well. Baruch atadonai, Eloheinu melech olam, shekitshanu b'mitzvotav etzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. So, um, Book of Judges has been, so far, a um, description of failure. So, um, Joshua has pointed out mostly success in uh, settling the land of Israel and vanquishing the native Canaanites. Here, in chapter one already, we're being told how the Israelites failed in that process, the, the, the Canaanite communities that they have <clears throat> failed to vanquish. And therefore, that will lead then to impending conflict um, and uh, also religious uh, temptation as well, that because the Canaanites are still there, the Israelites are going to be uh, tempted to uh, Canaanite idolatry. So that'll be a theme for the uh, for the rest of the Bible through through all the prophets. So that that's a major theme. What why was Israel why is Israel going to be exiled? Why are the Assyrians and the Babylonians going to conquer the land? Why um, why are the why are the why is the temple going to be destroyed? All because of falling into temptation to the Canaanites. Okay, so um, verse, we're on uh, verse 31 uh, on, on page 166. So we'll just read to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> uh, so we're talking about Zebulun and how Zebulun has what they failed to do. Asher lo horish et yoshve ako, Ve'at Yoshve Sidon, Ve'at Achlav, Ve'at Achziv, Ve'at Chelba, Ve'at Afik, Ve'at Rechov. So they uh, failed to dispossess the inhabitants. And just a second, Marlene is coming in. Um, they failed to dispossess the inhabitants of Akko, the inhabitants of Sidon. Uh, uh, we're not sure exactly where that is. Is that the one in Lebanon, or is there a different uh, place like that in, in the land of Israel? Uh, and Achlav, and Achziv, and Chelban, Afik, and Rachov. Uh, so we're on verse 32 now, uh, on page 166. And Vayeshev HaAsheri, oh, Asher Lohorish. <laughs> See, the word Asher can mean that. And I thought it was referring back to Zebulun, but Asher is also a name. And so it's the tribe of Asher. So Asher did not dispossess these places. Uh, now 32. Vayeshev ha'asheri bekerev ha'kina'ani yoshve ha'aretz kilo harisho. And the Asherites um, dwelled among the Canaanites dwelling there in a the land because they did not Dispossess them. Thirty-three. Naftali lohori shet yoshve beit shemesh viet yoshve beit anat vayeshev bekerev hakanani yoshve haaretz viyoshve beit shemesh uveit anat hayulahem lamas. So Naftali did not dispossess the inhabitants of Beit Shemesh and the inhabitants of Beit Anat, and they dwelled. That is, the Naphtalites dwelt among the Canaanites dwelling in the land, and the inhabitants of Beit Shemesh and Beit Anat were, became tributary to the Naphtalites. Okay, I'm just going to uh, mute all. Uh, just there's a little bit of distraction there. You know what to do if you need to ask a question or make a comment. Um, so the, um, so he, the Asherites did not uh, have their Canaanites that they were living among 
be tributaries to them, but the Naphtalites are able to. So in other words, as we see the failure, for some it was partial failure in that even though they didn't dispossess them, they were still in control over them so that the Canaanites had to pay tax to them. But, or there was a total failure and they were just living among them and there was no, uh, no tributary tax at all. 167. Um, so the um, the Amorites oppressed or forced the Danites to the hills uh, because the Amorites didn't let them go down to the valley. And the Amorites um, were resolved to settle in the in Har Cheres, in Ayalon, and Sha'alvim, uh, but the, uh, the, the house of Joseph did prevail over the Amorites, and they were able to make them into tributaries. And the boundary with the, the border with the Amorites was from Ma'ale Akrabim, from Selah, and upward, wherever that is. Okay, so let's just look at the commentary from verse 31 to the end here. And we have back on 166 on the right-hand side, among the Canaanites. They lived among them as best they could without affecting conquest, unlike their brothers in the South who asserted their military supremacy at the start and became the prominent element in the population. Right, so this is the problem that we'll see that Judah was able to prevail. Um, Joseph and all the tribes of the northern kingdom were not able to prevail in the same way. Naphtali, their territory lay in the eastern part of the Upper Galilee, north of Zebulun and Issachar and east of Asher. Beit Shemesh, Beit Anat, see on Joshua uh, 19. The latter is supposed to have been the seat of worship of the war goddess Anat. Others identify it with Tel El Kurbe, a mound in Upper Galilee. The name occurs in lists of conquests by the Egyptian kings Seti and Ramses II, where the determinative shows that it is the name of a deity. The late professor Samuel Klein identified it with Hine, between the Hermon mountain range and the Parpar River, approximately 30 kilometers southwest of Damascus. Okay, so ongoing, um, trying to figure out where these places are. Amorites, to the end of the chapter, this name is used to the, uh, of the inhabitants, this name is used of the inhabitants instead of Canaanites. They were the tallest and strongest of the seven nations of Canaan, as is evident from Amos chapter 2. It may also be a general term for all the nations of Canaan. So perhaps um, the commentary is suggesting Amorite and Canaanite are um, interchangeable terms. Don, this tribe attempted to gain a foothold southwest of Ephraim, but was checked by the native population who confined them to the district around Sora and Eshtaol. The main body of the tribe was accordingly compelled to seek a new home and finally establish itself in and around Laish. See chapter 18, and we'll see that probably is a story of Samson. Um, 35 were resolved to dwell. Initially, the Amorites caused Don to retreat to the mountains, where they too advanced, thereby necessitating aid from their neighbors, the house of Joseph. The latter, however, did not destroy them, but were content to subjugate them. Har, Har Heres, uh, the meaning is Sun Mountain. It is doubtless the equivalent of Beit Shemesh or Ir Shemesh, 
both of which were, are mentioned in the same context as I alone and Sha'alvim. The site has been sought at modern Ain Shams on the south side of the Wadi Surar, opposite Sura. I alone Sha'alvim, see Joshua 19. Ascent of Akrabim at the southeastern extremity near Aqaba, and Sela, literally the cliff or the rock, location unknown. So let's look at ancient Israel, see if uh, Robert Alter adds anything. That's on page 115. So, Akko, Sidon, Ach, Achyav, Achziv. These coastal towns bring us far to the north, near present day Haifa and beyond, with Sidon actually being a Phoenician city. So, Alter does. Uh, place that city Sidon in what is Lebanon today. Upon them, these words are merely implied in the Hebrew, and that's all he has to say. Okay, so let's let's read chapter two. Back to page one sixty seven. This chapter is uh, is twenty three sentences long. We'll see. Hopefully, we'll be able to get through it today. Vayal mal achadonai min hagilgal el habochim. Vayomer aale et chemi mitzrayim, va aviet chem el haaretz, asher nishbati la avote chem, va omar lo afer briti it chem la olam. So an angel of the Lord arose from Gilgal to Bochim, and it said, the angel said, I I brought you up from Egypt, and I brought you to the land that I swore to your ancestors, and I said, I will not uh, disregard or break my covenant with you forever. So it's interesting that an angel of God is saying this and not God. Um, and usually God would be speaking to a person um, as opposed to this angel speaking speaking to the people. So it's just, uh, uh, it's fascinating. It's an unusual way of the Bible to depict a communication from God to the people of Israel. You, there's usually an it, intermediary there. Even when God spoke to the entire people of Israel at Mount Sinai, Moses was there. So it's, it's, it was clear at the time that Moses was the leader of the people. Now there is no leader here, and we have an angel speaking to the people. So just we'll see what the commentary has to say about it in a little bit, but just keep that in mind that this is an unusual circumstance. Two, va'atem lo tichritu vrit leoshvei ha'aretz azot, mizbechotehem titotsun, velo shematem bekoli, Mazot asitem, and you uh, should make no treaty or covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break their altars, but you have not listened to my voice. What have you done? Vigam amarti lo agaresh otam mipnechem. Vahayu lachem lit sidim, veelohehem yihiyu lachem lamokesh. And I also said, um, I will not drive them out from before you, and they will be to you like snares, and their gods will be for you like a trap. So, in other words, God is saying, or the angel of God is saying, you know, you didn't fully, you didn't break all their altars. And so I'm going to leave that there as temptation to you. Vayahi, verse four, Vayahi kedaber malach Adonai et advarim ha'ele el kol b'nei Yisrael vayisu ha'am et kolam vayifku. And when the angel of God spoke these words, to all the people of Israel, the people raised up their voices and they wept. Vayikra'u shem hamakom hahu bochim. 
Vayizbechu Sham Ladonai. And they called that place Bochim, which is the plural verb, the, uh, crying, and they sacrificed there to God. Six. Um, Barry is coming back in. Um, we're at verse six now, chapter two. Vayeshalach Yehoshua et ha'am vayelchu b'nei Yisrael ish l'nachalato l'areshet et ha'aretz. Now this is fascinating. Joshua makes an appearance. Joshua's dead. So Joshua, so what is this doing uh, here at this point? That Joshua sent the people away and the people of Israel went everybody to their inherit their place of inheritance to inherit the land so is this a rehash of what happened at the end of uh, of chapter of of joshua yes it is but it's kind of unusual that it just pops up here it doesn't uh, appear as like a, with a note saying here we're going to remind you now of what happened a little while ago in the book of Joshua, it just poof right in the midst here. Seven. Ve'yavdu ha'am et Adonai kol yemei Yehoshua v'chol yemei hazekenim asher he'erichu yamim acharei Yehoshua asher ra'u et kol ma'aseh Adonai hagadol asher asal Yisrael. And the people of Israel worshipped or served uh, God all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that uh, lived long after Joshua, who saw all of the great acts of God that God did for Israel. Eight, Vayamot Yehoshua bin Nun, Eved Adonai, Ben Me'ave Eser Shanim. And Joshua died, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of God, died at age 110. Vayikberu oto bigvul nachalato, betim nat cheres, behar Ephraim, mitzafon lahar gaash. And they buried him at the edge, at the boundary, the border of his land holding, in Timnat cheres, on Har Ephraim, of north of Har of the Gaash mountain. Vegam ten, Vegam kol hador hahu, ne'esfu el avotav, vayakam dor acher acharehem, asher lo yadu et Adonai, vegam et hama'aseh asher asa le Yisrael. And all, also all that generation were gathered to their ancestors. It means that they died also. And a new generation arose after them who did not know God and also did not know uh, all that God did for Israel. So this is odd also. You know, our Jewish tradition is such that, uh, you know, it's a commandment to teach our children in every generation. So how is it that just one generation, they don't know uh, or not aware of what God did for them? How is that possible? How are, how are people not talking and not making sure that, that the children know what God did for them? I mean, we have the Seder. Didn't they have Passover? Weren't they telling the story? So th this is uh, just unusual for me and just striking to me that there's a statement like this. But again, it could be the editor of the book of Joshua kind of explaining how is it that the people of Israel fell so quickly and suddenly into idolatry when just one generation before they were rah-rah for God and rah-rah for Joshua. Yeah, Barry. So it'll obviously be really interesting to see what the commentators yeah. and more importantly, what what Robert Alter says. Yeah. But, I, but the immediate sense that I have is how the generation that, that comes after you is often a rebellious generation. Um, you know, it, it's often 
it's often it's often skips a generation and it's the next generation that sort of harkens back to to the grandparents era i mean that seems to be the case in modern times with with a lot of with a lot of political social religious things um and i wonder if if, if this is an exaggeration of that somehow it could be uh it's, it certainly is a social commentary it definitely is that uh you know the uh judges is all about uh, a comment on how um, the the Israelite world is working uh, at this time, and um, so yeah. So is it a comment also on our times? Um, you know, there there's a lot to be said about you know leadership, right? I, I'll just oversimplify here. Why is it? that the people running for president who are, who are probably going to be the, uh, the people on the ballot in November are uh, 80 years old. Right? So why are there no? I mean, yes, in the Republican Party, there are two people running who are in their 50s, right? Or, right, DeSantis and Haley are in their 50s, I'm just guessing. So, yeah, but nobody in the democratic party is 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 putting up a, a challenge to to biden so you, you, you ask that question you know it's rare that you get a kennedy at 35 years old running for 39 running for president of the united states so it's it's rare um um and so um uh, uh, so there's always a question about who who are the leaders let alone Who's the generation that's being led by these leaders? Yes. Uh, um, just a second. Uh, Kennedy uh, Jr. Wait. Well, I have to pause right here. Just a minute, please. Just one, one second, please. Okay. Hey, Siri, how old is Robert Kennedy Jr.? Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is 69 years old. Yeah. I thought. Dean Phillips is running against Biden because of age. Okay, um, I'm sorry about that. I had a just staff issue. Uh, so what were you saying, uh, Bess? It doesn't matter. Just report, talking, okay. going back okay. to Amongst the presidential yourselves. election. Yes. Irrelevant to okay. judges. <laughs> So um, I just got to say, Robert Kennedy Jr. is 69, not 34, 35. No, I'm talking about JFK. I meant that seriously. JFK. I didn't say RFK Jr. No, oh, no. I'm so, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were talking about this election. No, no, no. I'm talking. Right. I'm just the legitimate contenders. Anyway, it was, 40, it was just it was 40, again. 40, 40. Right. Um, I, I, I saw that. I saw so, you, so from you judges wrote... here. What's that? Barry? I, I saw that you had written that in, in one of your um, postings, um, or maybe it was in one of the classes. I, you, had, you had said a very similar thing about, oh, maybe it was in the newsletter that, you know, the, the, that the people are, the likely candidates are, are older. And, right. um, but, you know, there's also a question of, of, you know, every time, every time there's been a challenge against an incumbent president, it's resulted in a loss of election. And I think a lot of the candidates kind of recognize that. So, yeah, right. You know. Again, I, I don't want to uh, uh, to uh, to talk about politics, American politics in this Bible class. And I, I'm just I only brought it up just as because you, Barry, and your comment mentioned something about uh, American life. And I was just uh, just going off on that. Uh, the, the, the idea is, of, I think here from the book of Judges, is a comment on uh, the nature of Israelite religious life and why is it that so soon after leaving Egypt and settling the land of Israel, which the book of Joshua makes out to be a, uh, a miraculous event, in that God was involved to make sure that the people of Israel, who are not a well-trained armed force, were able to vanquish most of the Canaanite population and settle the land. 
So how is it that the people of Israel, one generation later, don't see the value, uh, the, don't see the prominence of God in their life? Right? That was a problem in the desert for 40 years. It's, a, it's an inherent uh, Israelite problem in the Bible, and it's an inherent Jewish problem throughout the ages, which I think is an inherent human problem. Well, a, 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 a human predicament. That is, how, why is it that people have, are challenged to not see God in their life? Okay, so, so that's, that's a problem that all religions have uh, in, in maintaining um, adherence, right? That, uh, and, and, and how quickly we forget. Right, 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 right. So, yeah. So, uh, in other words, uh, the issue is how, why do we believe in God and how do we maintain a belief in God? Do we need miracles in our life every day in order to be reminded, right? So, I, I just started wearing this, this uh, piece of tape with the, the number today, the number 98 on it, to help me, like Rachel Goldberg, the mother of Hirsch Goldberg, a hostage in Gaza, has said on a video, why, why can't everybody do this to bring attention to remembering the, the plight of the hostages, right? Why is Israel being under, uh, under attack at the International uh, Criminal Court in The Hague, accused of genocide, when nothing about Hamas as a terrorist organization is being brought up at, in in that trial, Israel's accused of genocide, but the uh, people, the world forgets why um, Hamas attacked and why um, and and that there are still hostages there. So uh, right. So we need. Why do we wear a talus every day when we pray to remind us of the commandments and God's presence? So. Uh, humans being the, the, the nature of, of humanity is that we need constant reminders. So uh, isn't that like the Jonah, isn't that like the old saying? I think it's just human nature, right? That people say, yes, what, what have you yes. done for me lately? So it's good. Uh, so many things you've done and everyone says that. Right, right. So for the Bible, the, the issue is, you know, the, that uh, the people of Israel here are and throughout the bible now will be these this um used to be a um uh, a, a, as as a as an example for teaching about hu human the failure of humanity that we have the potential to be great the potential to be morally and ethically good and the bible teaches um how much we fail at our uh, potential. And I think that that's, uh, clearly that's a problem with the world today. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, every day we see uh, the failure of humanity. Uh, you know, the rise of crime in, in the district, right? That's, that's on the news every night, uh, carjackings in the district, uh, by um, by by minors, uh, uh, murder rate increasing, uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, poverty increasing, homeless homelessness increasing, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's we're constant reminders of the failure of humanity, um, and um, also the lack of moral leadership to try to convince people to change their ways. And that's, that's something that we've been lacking in uh, recently. I mean, you have a, a moral voice like Martin Luther King Jr. Um, uh, I don't know, how many, how many moral voices like that, that are national moral voices that people look up to, the people that, that those voices have enabled people to change their, um, their behavior. You just, you, those examples are few and far between. And it's, it's tragic 
that that's the human that that's the human condition. So I think that that's an element that's going to be um, here from the book of Judges and and on. Um, okay, so verse eleven. Vayasu uh, bnei Yisrael et hara bnei Adonai vayavdu et habealim. And the people of Israel did bad in the eyes of God, and they uh, worshipped the Baals, so the Baalim, so the different Baal gods of the Canaanites. Twelve, v'yazvu et Adonai Elohei avotam hamotzi otam me'eretz mitzrayim v'yelchu acharei Elohim acherim me'elohei ha'amim asher sivivotehem v'yishtachavu lahem Vayach isu et Adonai. And they forsook God, the God of their ancestors, who took them out of the land of Egypt. And they went, the people of Israel went, followed after uh, other gods from the gods of the peoples that were around them. And they bowed down to them and they made God angry. Well, it says provoked God, but made God angry. Thirteen, vayazvu et Adonai vayavdu la Baal vila Ashtarot, and they forsook God and worshipped Baal and Ashtarot. So there are these Baal gods, and there are these Ashtarot gods. Vayichar af Adonai bi Israel, vayit name biad shosim, vayashosu otam. Vayim kareim biad oivehem misaviv velo yachlu od laamod lifne oivehem, and God's anger grew against Israel, and He gave them in the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them. What that means, I'm not, I don't know, but let's see how. Um, and the Lord's revenge gave them into the hand of the plunderers who plundered them. That's how Alter translates it. Um, and they sold them um, in, uh, he sold them to their enemies around about, and they weren't able anymore to withstand their enemies. Right? They started to lose battles against their enemies. So the people worshiped the Baals and the Ashtarot, they forsook God, and therefore God got angry, and God allowed then the enemy to have the upper hand. Uh, 15. Um, wherever they went, the hand of God was against them for bad as God spoke to them and he warned them, if you forsake me, I'm going to do bad for you, uh, as he swore to them um, and they were um, very dis distressed. 16. Vayakem Adonai Shoftim Vayoshium Miad Shosehem. But God caused judges to, ri to rise up and save them from the hand of their, um, what was the word, uh, plunderers, from the plunderers. Vigam el Shoftehem lo Shameu, ki Zanu Achere Elohim Acherim, Vayishtachavulahem. Saru maher min haderech, asher halchu avotam, lishmoa mitzvot Adonai, lo asu chen. And also the judges were not listened to uh, because they were, they went astray. But the word for going astray is that they were, it, it's the word for prostitute. So they were attracted to be going away uh, to turn from the path uh, after other gods, and they w which they bowed down to, uh, they uh, quickly turned away from the path that their ancestors were walking down um, to uh, to uh, no longer listen to.
the commandments of God. Okay, 18. Vechi hekim Adonai lahem shoftim, vehaya Adonai im hashofet, vehoshiyam miyad oivehem, kol yemei hashofet, ki yenachem Adonai mina'akatam, mipnei lo chatsehem vedochakehem. And, and God would cause the judges to rise up, and the hand of God was with, uh, no, and, and God was with the judge, and he saved them from their enemies all the days of that judge. Uh, and God um, uh, saved them from their groaning, from the oppression, from the oppression and the crushing. So, so this is like a, um, an introduction to what's going to happen the rest of the book of Judges, that a judge will come and God will be with the judge and save the people during the time of the judge, only to see that after the judge, the people will quickly go back to their sinning ways. Uh, 19. And when the judge would die, uh, they would return and would um, um, uh, uh, deal corrupt uh, and be more corrupt than their father, than their ancestors, to go after other uh, gods to worship them, to bow down to them. They left nothing undone from their practices and from their stubborn ways. Vayichar af Adonai bi Yisrael, vayomer ya'an asher avru hagoi hazeh et briti asher tziviti et avotam velo shamu lekoli. And God was angry very angry at Israel and said, um, because uh, this nation um, uh, transgressed my covenant that I commanded their ancestors and didn't listen to my voice. Uh, 21, Gam ani lo osif lohorish ish mipnehem, I also will not add or enable them to add more conquest from before them. Like I, I won't allow them to be able to conquer any more from the nations um, because they, um, um, uh, after they left Joshua and he, uh, after Joshua left and died. Lemaan nasot bam et Yisrael, hashomrim heim et derech Adonai la lechet bam kasher shamru avotam imlo. Doing all this in order to test the uh, the people of Israel whether they will uh, observe the way of God to follow it uh, as their ancestors followed or not. Vayanach Adonai et hagoyim haele. So God left those nations without driving them out hastily, uh, neither, uh, and he didn't deliver them into the hand of Joshua. Okay, so um, the idea, again, of um, setting out for us what the book of Joshua is going to be about, and also what I'm saying is what the rest of the Bible is about, the, uh, the failure of the people of Israel to live up to the, the covenant. Okay, so let's see what the commentary has to say back on page 167 on the right-hand side or at the bottom. The period of warlike activity was over, and the newcomers, now firmly established, settled down to a normal life. But the fears of Moses and Joshua with regard to the evil effects which would ensue from Israel's contact with the native cults soon proved to be well founded. The angel of the Lord, the Hebrew may be translated a messenger of the Lord in rabbinic tradition echoed in the Targum, he was Pinchas, 
Ah, so uh, like I said, th this was a problem here where you haven't seen this kind of, of uh, communication from God to the people. There's usually God speaking with a person being the intermediary, not an angel of God. And so that's why the Targum, the Aramaic translation based on Midrash says, uh, it's, it's Pinchas, who's the Kohen, he's the high priest at the time. Okay, that's also unusual. It's usually not the high priest who is speaking for God. Um, uh, we have Aaron and Moses together in Egypt, but that's before Aaron becomes a high priest. So we don't have we don't have Aaron speaking on God's behalf. Okay, so uh, and we don't have a high priest also speaking on behalf of God in the rest of the Bible either. Okay, so uh, Gilgal. See on Joshua 4, here the messenger of God received the divine communication, and to this spot, later known as Bochim, he summoned the people for condemnation. It's also possible that the people were already assembled at Bochim for another purpose and were condemned by Pinchas at that gathering. Bochim, a mountainous site near Beit Be El, some supported by the, the, the 70, that is the Septuagint, the Greek translation, see a connection with Alon Bachut, below Beit El. The Masoretic text marks a lacuna. Yeah, so there's an asterisk there at the top of the page, uh, meaning that there's something missing, uh, indicating a pause, perhaps alluding to the assembling of the people prior to the prophet's rebuke. See the preceding paragraph. Made, literally will make. The use of the future for the past is common in biblical Hebrew. Rashi explains the tense as referring to the intention of God when he redeemed Israel from Egypt. Although the subject of he said is the messenger, the words that follow reproduce the form in which the divine communication was made to him to be reported to the people. Covenant, not the oath just mentioned, but the covenant with conditions attached to its fulfillment as described in Exodus 34. The verse refers to the prohibition against coming to terms with the native population. population. Break down, see Exodus 34. The root means pull down, pull to pieces, and is applicable to an altar constructed from a number of stones. What is this you have done? The question is rhetorical and carries a note of indignation. It's commonly used in the Bible, for example, in Genesis 12. Uh, Ehrlich understands it as, how could you have done this? Wherefore, this is not the meaning of the Hebrew vigam, and is obviously introduced in order to give the sequence of protasis and apodosis to the whole passage. Namely, I said I will not break my covenant on condition that you keep your share of the contract, but you have not hearkened. Therefore, I have now said, etc. Another way of construing the text is to translate and I also, and suppose that the reference is to a previous warning, such as is found in Numbers 33 or Joshua 30, 23. Okay, so just a comment there about the, 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 the Hebrew and the formula here about the punishment and why, why they're being punished. Yes, Barry. The, 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 the commentary says that this was Pincus who yes. had the communication, but the text itself says that the entire generation is gone now. Uh, no, it's, it's it's a, instead of the angel of God speaking here, that the, that the, what we're told is on uh, verse one, the commentary says that's not the angel of God, it's Pinchas. So it's Pinchas speaking to the, the people and, and relaying this religious message to them. But the text had already said that everybody in that generation was gone. Right, but there are other people there, and that's who Pinchas is. To, uh, that's who this angel of God is speaking to. And the angel of God is Pinchas coming back to. The commentary is suggesting that it's Pinchas. Oh, and Pinchas. Well, yes. So the generation's gone, but maybe this one leader is still there. Okay, I see your point. Yeah, so Pinchas should have been dead already. Yeah, no. Uh, again, it's it's the midrash saying. Right, so Joshua and Caleb stayed alive while the whole generation died in the desert. Right, so maybe the same idea. Uh, Pinchas is staying as uh, stayed alive. Okay, uh, one sixty nine. The noun uh, snares. The na the noun sedim 
is literally sides. Kimchi, a medieval commentator, regards the word as elliptical and explains it as thorns in the sides. He suggests alternatively that may we, we may render it as snares, making the noun a derivation of the root sud, to hunt. The, da, the, uh, the dot in the dalid being a substitute for the missing long vowel. Okay. The, the, fig, the figures of snares and trap are reminiscent of such passages as Exodus 23 and Deuteronomy 7. Okay. Wept. The national and religious conscience was dormant, but not dead. An appeal to it always drew an emotional response on the people. They called. The subject is either those present at the assembly or men generally. If the latter, the Hebrew may be rendered the place was called. Bochim, the name means weepers, but no place so called is otherwise known. Similar sounding names are found in Alon Bachut and the Valley of Baca, which have the similar root related to um, uh, related to uh, crying. And Emek Habacha, it's in um, it's in Lachadodi. Every Friday night, we refer to the Emek Habacha, the, the Valley of Tears, uh, because the whole uh, Lachadodi thing uh, poem is about you know, desolation of exile and looking forward to re being restored to a land rebuilt. Okay. Um, so commentary goes on. The writer, before resuming the narrative, makes a recapitulation by recalling that after the assembly at Shechem, Joshua had dismissed the people to their allotted territories and Israel remained faithful to God during his lifetime and of the elders who had assisted him in the leadership. The new generation abandoned the old paths and succumbed to the heathen influences around them. God's anger was aroused and punishment fell heavily upon them in the form of enslavement and subjection to foreign powers. Consequent repentance led to deliverance by the hand of leaders appointed by God, who judged and temporarily recalled them to his worship. But the death of a judge was the signal for a fresh and even graver lapse into local idolatry. God accordingly vowed that he would not drive out the inhabitants of the land, but leave them as a test of Israel's steadfastness. Events demonstrated that the test had failed. It's correct to assume from the tone of the passage that in the author's view, what really mattered was not the facts of Israel's history, but the moral and religious lessons which it taught. Okay, almost a, uh, six to 10, almost a verbatim repetition of Joshua 24. Six, when Joshua had sent the people away, an introductory clause connecting what follows with the narrative as it ends in the book of Joshua. His inheritance, the portion allotted to each tribe by Joshua, to possess in the manner described in chapter one of this book. Elders, the leaders as defined in Numbers 11, they were the guardians of Israel's laws and religion. See, Moses received the Torah on Sinai, Sinai and handed it down to Joshua and Joshua to the elders, right? That's in Pirkei Avot, the sixth chapter um, section from the Mishnah, which the very first statement has the order of leadership from Moses to Joshua, to the elders, to the kings. Um, outlived, literally prolonged days. Who had seen, in verse 10 in Joshua 24, the verb used is had known. The idea implied in both verbs is personal experience as distinct from hearsay or tradition. All the great work of the Lord, the deliverance from Egypt, the miracles in the wilderness, and the successful campaigns of the Jordan, as well as, as, well as in Canaan. 110 years, the same age as his ancestor Joseph. Order, that is territory. Timnat Heres in Joshua, it appears as Timnat Serah. In rabbinic tradition, the origin of the name picture of the sun is, is traced to an image of that luminary which was placed over Joshua's grave, as if to say, there lies, there lies the man who caused the sun to stand still. Uh, the hill country of Ephraim, the highlands stretching from the north of Jerusalem to the valley of Jezreel. Gaash, the root meaning is to quake indicating that at one time the mountain was volcanic. 
The rabbis indeed tell us that the mountain quaked over them to kill them for neglecting to mourn Joshua fittingly. And all that generation, the contemporaries of Joshua who survived him were gathered unto their fathers, that is, their souls were gathered in with those of their forefathers. This is a common expression frequently used in the Bible to denote death. See, gathered unto his people or slept with his fathers. They knew not the Lord, nor yet the work. Uh, 67 years had passed from the Exodus. So th this is rabbis again, uh, suggesting that that's how long it took. Um, it was 40 years in the desert, and now 27 years uh, through the time of Joshua. Although there probably were people living who were in their 80s, who had also witnessed many of the miracles, since they possessed no Torah wisdom, this experience was not enough to protect the Jews from the ideologies of the natives, and they succumbed. Metsudat David explains that they knew not the Lord through logic, nor did they remember the work he had wrought. All right, so why Ralbag, um, the, uh, one medieval commentary suggests that some people were still alive from the Exodus until now, when it says that people were not alive, don't know why he would suggest that, but they, he said it's one thing to have uh, witnessed miracles, it's another thing to have to study Torah, to understand the theology behind the miracle and the texts of Judaism behind the miracles in order to have a foundation. Miracles aren't enough of a foundation. You need um, law values to undergird it. So, okay. Uh, we go on, uh, we're on 171, 11, children of Israel. There is a note of pathos in the phrase. How tragic that the children of the great and pious ancestor who had striven with God and with men and prevailed should sink to idolatry. Evil in the sight of the Lord, that is, first they did what was evil by violating the commandments in general, then they rebelled and worshipped idols, first in conjunction with their worship of God, and then by abandoning his worship and denying his existence completely. Baalim, plural of Baal, Lord, Master, so-called because they stood in this relationship with their devotees. The term doubtless applies not to the numerous images of the gods or the various local forms of one god, but to the different deities worshipped in the land. The Baalim were generally nature gods and had their priests who carried on a cult, often associated with immoral rites and human sacrifice. Out of the land of Egypt, the memory of Israel's bondage in that country lingered in the mind of posterity, and it should have aroused the gratitude of the people to keep them loyal to the God who had redeemed them. Followed other gods, that is, they abandoned monotheistic worship and followed other gods in conjunction with their worship of God. Provoked, almost in a sense of defied. They forsook the Lord. This is not a mere repetition, as supposed by modern commentator commentators, but an indication of complete abandonment of their worship of God. It should not be understood that all the Israelites had completely forsaken the worship of God, but that many of them worshiped the idols to such an extent that it appeared as though they had completely abandoned the worship of the Almighty. Moreover, this was only for short periods of time. Since the faithful should have protested, it's counted as though the entire generation had worshiped idols exclusively. Baal and the Ashtarot, uh, often mentioned together. Baal is not a proper name and is frequently joined to a complement. For example, Baal of Tyre, Baal of Pa'ur. There was consequently many a Baal in Canaan. Sometimes the plural is used and at other times the singular for the whole group of false gods. Ashtarot is the plural of Ashtoret, the Phoenician Ashtart. She was one of the most widely worshipped deities in the ancient Semitic Near East. The word is found as Ishtar in Babylonia and Assyria, Ashtar in Arabia, and Atar in Syria. The Philistines erected a temple in her honor. Her name appears in the place of Ashtaret Karnaim and uh, on the Moabite stone as Ashtar Kamosh. No satisfactory explanation has yet been given of the etymology of the word. Kimchi connected it with the young of the flock, which he explains as the females of the flock. 
spoiled, the punctuation indicates that the root of this verb is shasas, while that of shosim is shasa, both having the same meaning. In the Amarna letters, shasi and shasa denote the nomadic robber tribes of the desert south of Canaan. Gave them over, literally sold them, made them, to, made them subject to. The enemies round about, Israel's punished by those very nations with whom they had made treaties. Could not any longer stand as they had done in the days of Joshua for the idea that sin was the cause of their discomfiture. See Joshua 7. Went out, the Hebrew verb is often used in the sense of marching out to war, make a foray, setting out on a campaign. The Midrash sees here an allusion to the misfortunes of Elimelech, Machlon, and Chilion described in Ruth 1. Okay, that, um, all right. So that the term also uh, uh, alludes to misfortune coming about. The Lord had sworn, uh, see Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Well, in 173, judges, champions, and leaders whom the critical conditions of the time brought to the fore. They hearkened not. Uh, this cannot mean that the relief obtained for them by their deliverers had no effect upon them. That would be contrary to the accounts in this book. But the repentance was only temporary. Disobedience recurred after the death of the judge, as stated in verse 19. Went astray, the verb literally acted adulterously, aptly describes Israel's lust for the Baalim, strange husbands. To Hosea, with his personal bitter experience, the adulterous wife became the figure of Israel's faithlessness to the covenant with God. Right, so the went astray is based on this word zona, prostitute, and Hosea was commanded in his book to marry a prostitute to be a living example of um, a, a living metaphor of how the people of Israel were acting. Uh, quickly, only a few years after the death of Joshua and the elders. For it repented the Lord, better it would repent the Lord. This phrase does not signify that God changed his mind because God is not man that he should repent, but he was moved to pity. The language has been described as a condescension as a conden, as a condescension to the imperfection of human speech. Turn back, they relapsed into their former idolatry. The tense in the Hebrew is the imperfect frequentative, expressing habitual action. Dealt more corruptly, they naturally went a step further than their fathers, disregarding the scruples which in some measure still restrained their forebears. Their fathers, not the righteous generation of Joshua, but the generation which preceded the evildoers. Their, namely of their predecessors, practices in a bad sense. Or on 174, 20, this nation, the writer uses the noun goy, which is seldom employed as a term for Israel. It's been suggested that a deliberate slight may have been the reason for the choice of the word here. Even the addition of ze, this, is thought to carry a tone of alienation like the Latin iste. Right, so in the Hebrew here, referring to the people of Israel as goy um, is unusual. The people of Israel is, is referred to as am, nation, not goy. The other nations are called goyim. I also, the sequence of thought is, because Israel failed to keep his part of the compact, I also will not keep mine. Left, the use of azav is unusual. These nations are specified in the next chapter. The verse states the reason that God considered it desirable that Joshua should leave some of the Canaanite nations unconquered. Prove, the text has an infinitive without a subject, a construction which creates ambiguity. The commentators interpret it as the writer's explanation of the divine purpose. Keep the way of the Lord, that is, observe the ordinances laid down by him, carry out the practical precepts. This verse is an explanation of the proceeding. Between them, the two verses attempt to answer the questions raised by the statement in 21, the second half of 21, namely, why did God allow any nations to remain after Joshua's conquests? Why did God not enable him to exterminate them at once? The answer is because he wished to prove Israel, therefore he left them unconquered by Joshua. Okay, it's 1031, we'll stop here. Next time we'll read uh, Alter's commentary to chapter two before we continue with chapter three. All right.
Have a good rest of the day, everybody. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Shalom.